So uh, welcome in. Uh, we're going to go through a process today of, you know, really how it works. We're going to talk about uh, a couple different casting methods uh, when it comes to um, the difference between kind of tilt pour, static pouring, um, you know, differences that you may see in different processes from, uh, you know, sand castings versus permanent mold. Um, but, you know, happy to be joined here by a, uh, a veteran. Um, but before we get started here, uh, any questions you have, uh, please pose them in chat. Uh, as I mentioned, um, as some of you were hopping on, uh, Rachel and Jonathan will uh, try and answer or get us to answer questions live. So, uh, you know, put us under a microscope here. Um, you know, any questions that you guys have pertaining to the, uh, the information being shared today, we'd be happy to, uh, you know, answer them for you. Yep. With that uh, being said, as I mentioned, so uh, excited to be joined with a, uh, a veteran, uh, Monty. So Monty is a manufacturing design engineer here at Batesville Products um, with over 40 years of experience. Uh, so he, he's seen and done it all uh, from different processes, different types of metals. Um, you know, so it's so a lot of good uh, knowledge and experience. So, so welcome. Appreciate you joining us today. Um, and then I'm, if you don't know me, I'm uh, Tim Williams, National Sales Manager here at Batesville Products. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So the, the first process we're hopping into here uh, is what we call a static pour process. Um, give, give us an example uh, here, Monty, of, of where or what type of process we typically would see this involved in. Some static pours are used in uh, sand casting as well as permanent mold. Um, for instance, a permanent mold uh, can be a wheel mold where it is stationary except for uh, six slides. Okay, okay. Sand, sand molds are stationary, but using a uh, top sprue to pour into it, uh, fill through gating or risering. Okay, so it's listed up there um, on the slides that you know it's a traditional or dump. Is that because that's exactly how they're doing it? It's yeah, it's they're just dumping the metal into a sprue that okay. feeds the runners. Okay. As far as sand goes. Okay. Permanent mold, you're dumping into a riser that feeds the casting. Okay. So is this type of process what what, what may be some benefits um, of, of doing this type of process or what may be some negatives of doing this type of process? Well, the negative for permanent mold is you're dumping directly into a riser that sits on top of the casting. So the difference between like a sand versus a permanent mold, yes. you're dumping directly in in a sand versus a permanent mold, you're you're going through the gates and risers to really yes. get it there. Well, you, on sand, you're using uh, risers along with runners as well. Okay. But you're dumping through the top just like a permanent mold. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, so what, what, what kind of challenges would you see in this type of process? You really have to watch where you're pouring with uh, static because uh, it can create a lot of shrink if you're not going into a heavy section. Okay. If you're pouring into a light section, you got to watch getting shrink or even turbulence for gas. Okay. So I think, as you mentioned, um, you know, the, the, the runners, I mean, it, it becomes very important on how you're feeding the casting. When you're dumping directly into the the runner, uh, you can run into some turbulence issues. Exactly. Okay. Um, that's why your runners on sand casting. What I used to do is run it past and angle all your gating in gates opposite, so it runs past first, then comes back and feeds casting. Okay. So what a uh, the, the picture on the right there uh, really gives you a good example, I think, of, of what we're talking about here today. Is, is do you ever see static pouring? Is it is it ever transferable to the permanent mold, or do you it's, mostly see it well, in sand? Uh, I have seen a lot of it in permanent mold. Okay. Uh, as far as wheels go, um, do you lose the small, benefit? Small round parts is the best. Okay. Okay. So um, like a lot of wheels. Or, yeah, okay. you can dump right down the center where it's getting bored out. Gotcha. So with that comment, so it sounds like a, a, the benefits really come uh, if you're if you're directly dumping into the product, you're getting that benefit if you can remove that material at a later. Yes. Uh, step. If, you, if you're machining it out. OK. Yes. OK. Because that could likely just be bad material. Exactly. OK. OK. Because that's where your gas and, and shrinks going to be is in the center. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Is there a size limitation on this type of pour process? 
Great question. Uh, size limit. Is there a size limitation on static pouring? I've seen some pretty large wheels made with static pour. On the permanent uh, mold? Yes. Okay. Um, no. Now in sand, there is no limitation. Okay. You can go with uh, uh, air set and go up to 20,000 pound cast. Okay. Does it become more challenging the bigger the casting? I think it's easier. It's easier. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Especially to get into steel. Okay. Yeah. Why, why is that? Um, everything's larger, just easier to work with. Okay. Okay. So you can eliminate some of those trouble sections. Exactly. Because you have much so bigger large, space. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. Great. Hey, Tim. Good question. question. Another question that came in. Um, does yeah. the operator control the pour on static versus tilt pour process? Uh, yes, the operator does. You have to do a steady pour, uh, try to eliminate some of the turbulence. So, so that could differ between you and me. That's right. You know, big, strong guy, exactly. small, weak guy over here, you know? <laughs> uh, so, that, so on a static pour, the, the pour rate, I mean, it's, it's all based on the operator. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Good question. And a lot of your larger castings, it doesn't depend on operator. It depends on the uh, ladle itself because um, you're actually dumping a portable furnace versus sure. a, a hand ladle. Okay, so they're they're using more of the automated uh, pot size ladles exactly. to dump the metal versus you or me trying to, to dump it and control Monty and I, I've, I've which done, would be a problem. We've done up to 20,000 pounds of pour. Okay, okay, wow, it's a lot of metal. <clears throat> it is. We had another great question come through, and I think it'll be good to talk through with the tilt pour process. So I'll ask okay. it now, and then you guys can explain the process and determine which one's better. Sure. But the question is, are there limitations with regard to part complexity for static pour versus tilt pour? For example, if a tool is very complex, would it be more difficult to put it in a tilt pour machine? It's a great question. Uh, I got I my think, answer. I think you're <laughs> limited on a static pour versus a tilt pour. Yeah. Um, okay. You can add hydraulics and loose pieces, slides, uh, cores into a permanent mold where you can't on a static pour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, complexity is a, a very important part. So when yeah. you create the steel tool and permanent mold, um, it allows you to really define out and hold tighter tolerances and more complexities yep. uh, because you're cutting that into a steel mold. Think of the even the static pour. If you're if you're talking on a um, on a permanent mold side of things, a static pour you can de define out some of the the details there, but you're really constrained by the the cavities in in how you open that mold. And also also your cores. Exactly, yes. exactly. And then whereas the same, you know, think of. You got to build a sand mold that that creates all these complexities. And really, you only have two directions for a core on a static mold. Okay. Upper and lower. Yeah. And then you have four slides. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how's the tilt pour process work then? Great. Uh, yeah. So tilt pour process. Um, so tell us a little bit about tilt pour. We've talked a, a little bit about permanent mold and the the static side of things, but uh, a little bit more about permanent mold from the, the uh, tilt pour. Tilt pour is a little more forgiving. You can control the um, tilt timing, which controls turbulence or the flow of the metal. Um, gating also helps with that, but you can slow it down. You can speed it up uh, depending on the casting shape and size. Um, you have more flexibility with cores on a tilt pour. Um, you have mainly three sides to work with for hydraulics. You have the top and bottom as well. Okay. So uh, a conversation you and I were having actually before we had uh, gone live here, can you apply coatings to the till pour process the same you would apply them? Can you apply coatings to sand? It, the coatings would be, no, sand, no. Okay. There are no coatings except for wash for sand. Okay. Uh, wash is just to keep it from burning in. Okay, so so explain the, the coatings that, that are used in tilt pour process. Um, you know, we, we just mentioned a little bit about the static side of things, but um, you know, what, what are the coatings used for on a, on a permanent mold or a tilt pour? Well, we have three different coatings. Uh, one coating is the uh, primer or you should say binder that uh, holds the second 
spray, which is a brown, which is a thermal coating. It holds heat. And we also have a blue coating. I can't tell you exactly what their part numbers are, but the blue coating is a release, release agent. Okay. Yeah, so so different coatings that, that uh, serve a different purpose to really try and make sure that you know, when, when Jonathan and Rachel are asking about these complicated parts, we're making sure that we're trying to feed correctly where we want to feed correctly, yes. you know, uh, really increase the turbulence in areas if we want to feed the metal quicker. Or, yeah. um, and also, uh, you, where you want to hold heat better, you use so some thermals. Or thermal. yep. Okay. Um, if you want to strip the part easier, use a little blue okay. with the brown. So you still get the thermal, but you use the blue to release. Okay. So uh, we actually have an interesting demonstration here today. Uh, bear with me. Uh, we were making fun of the fact that early on that we got a pretty old uh, bottle opener here, uh, but a very good example of a till pour process. Um, for those of you that, that drink or enjoy a cold beverage from uh, your, your local restaurant. Uh, so think of the way a, uh, a bartender would, would fill the, the, uh, your beer in the cup. So um, yes, I do have a beer here today and I have a cup. So the tilt pour process where Monty and I were just talking about, you know, the static pour, it's all based on the, um, the operator and what the operator is pouring and how fast they're pouring. Right. Um, control on the, the tilt pour process is we, we soft automate and the, the machine tilts at a certain rate. Yeah. So a good example would be, you know, how that bartender then is pouring that down the side of the glass and it gradually tilts back so you can get a nice, you know, foamless beer at the top there. And then your part sets, and then when it's ready to eject, it tilts back. And I'm not going to do that because I don't want beer all over the table here. <laughs> um, but it'll tilt back, and then you can eject the part. Uh, so on, on tilt pour processes, there is a benefit of um, the machine controlled side of things. Right. Uh, again, you know, soft automation or even automation, uh, um, you know, that, that's being used across the industry as well to help assist. And even from the pour cut perspective, yeah. you know, the amount of metal that's being poured as the machine tilts backwards there. So. Uh, that's a good way to think about it. I know our, our team here uses that quite a bit as a uh, as a example. Um, so so definitely a good way to, to look at that there. I have a question for you guys. Absolutely. So based off of um, the tilt pour process, you control the speed and the angle in which you pour the metal into the gates and risers to fill up the part. Does it change based off of the geometry, size, and weight of the part? It does. Every, every part is different. Okay. Yeah, another, another way we, we explain um, the process is that it's, it's custom, right? So if, if you're coming to uh, our team or any team, they should be asking questions around uh, the different complexities that go into your part, the, the different types of surface finishes, mm -hmm. where you're looking for those, um, tolerancing from a machine perspective afterwards, tolerancing from a cast perspective. Right. Um, you know, a lot of times there's there's uh, companies out there that have parts that get hidden. So you don't really need exactly. great surface finish in certain areas. Surface, uh, and they'll even allow a little press to here. And yeah, there. absolutely. Absolutely. So it, it'll still be a very dense casting because it's right. using the till pour process. Um, but a lot of the, the surface finish, you know, secondaries, yeah. you know, could be eliminated because they don't need it. <laughs> Whereas there are some industries, so, you know, you get a lot of it in food and medical that that's, high surface that's finish. That's one reason why I use uh, permanent mold versus sand. Okay. Because of properties, metal properties. Sure. You get better properties with permanent mold. And, and you see a lot of that, again, you know, in the medical and the, yeah. the food equipment side of things. Um, you know, if you think of the FDA, they, they got to control... Sure. Their blood getting stuck somewhere, or food food particles getting stuck within equipment. And that's just not uh, something that passes. So a dense casting from a till pour process is a good route to go. Good question. Hey Tim, while you're talking about turbulence, there was a question that came in about the porosity difference between static and till pour. I know we're getting into porosity a little bit later, but um, I just wanted to kind of talk about that. Why we still have this slide up. Yeah, so um, we, we had actually a really good uh, previous webinar, Jonathan, on, on that topic, uh, the difference between porosity, uh, gas entrapment, uh, different types of, of porosity or yeah. imperfections. Um, I would say the, the best answer to that question would really be sharing that uh, with that individual afterwards. 
um, because there's a lot that goes into that um, being custom parts. Every, every part flows a different way. Every part's gated or, yeah. um, you you're, know, you're more apt to get more gas with a static pour than you would a tilt pour. Is that due to directly feeding into yes. the, the pour? The, pour? And the more time you have in the atmosphere, the more gas you're going to collect. Okay. But Jonathan, uh, uh, to further answer that question, if it's an individual, make sure we uh, get that, that person's name and we can share that information afterwards. Sounds great. So on that, thanks for the uh, the softball there, Jonathan. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so so till pour process again, you're you're controlling it, yes. right? So with control uh, comes being able to solve out some of the the issues or the problems that we could run into. Yep. Um, less turbulence, less gas, if possible. Yep, that depends on your furnace too as well. Uh, the coatings uh, we're working on better coating, not we, but people are industry. working on yep. the industry is yep. working on better coatings. And I think I think with even with the uh, with the, the control process, um, you know, as we were mentioning different industries and, and you, either the parts hidden, not hidden, right. they, they, they can deal with a little bit of proxy. I think what's nice about the, this process as well is you can control where you put it. Yes. Right. So yeah. um, you can move uh, shrink or prosody yep. by using chills or you can never get rid of it, but nope. you can move it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, so you could, you could put it in in the gates sure. right or the push it yep absolutely um yeah so so we had mentioned a little bit of this earlier on uh but obviously again with the control process beer down the side of beer glass you're getting denser castings uh so a lot stronger parts yep. um machine ability afterwards uh so the machine's much better too yes. okay because of the properties so so what what helps on the machining side is it is it a softer material because we're talking about stronger uh, parts but most most sand castings, they don't cast with a th uh, 356. Okay. 357. Yeah, 356. Uh, most of them I've used was 319. It's a softer metal. Okay. Um, it's, it's a gummier metal until you heat treat. Gotcha. And then it's easier to machine. Okay. So you're trying to essentially bake the part and make it denser. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so, so here's a good example. Um, we just talked about how essentially we can move, you know, in a tilt process, yeah. it, you can move the, the issues out of the part. Um, so this is part of what we do here, uh, but it's seen across the industry. Uh, really, it's a way to, to digitally solve problems before you cut into the tool. Um, and it, we recommend it. I mean, we do it with every single tool that comes through here. Uh, but it's not to say it solves everything because you get into the process it's and now a, you're in the real world. It's, right? a, it's a tool. It, it gets is. you started. It gives you a good start point. Absolutely. Absolutely. So walk, walk me through what we're seeing here. Uh, so you can see the cups, two cups, one on each side <clears throat> that holds the metal. And as it tips, you can see it pouring and filling the cavity. Um, the blue is actually, in this case, I think the hot metal. And as it solidifies, it's turning uh, kind of a greenish and then up to the yellow. And that's how your solidification is. The colors are a little opposite than they should be, but it's still the same thing. Sure. When you guys use and FEA analysis, do you guys look at temperature as well? Yes, we do. Temperature, your, your flow, uh, It'll also show you where shrink is possibly going to be. Uh, there's a number of different things. I, there's too many to name off <laughs> that you can use. Yeah, um, it, it, you know, it's it's a great, uh, as Monty mentioned, it's a great tool. Yeah, um, it's you get in the real world, and obviously, different different environments control different yeah, things. It's you know, not it's not a bible. You can't go 100 percent off of this. Exactly. Exactly. Right. I mean, you can get out and it could be a hot, humid day yeah. and that could change things or it could be frigid. You know, we're going through winter right now. It could be a different temperature in the, the facility. And we, we are going through this right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> out of curiosity, what is like the best climate to cast in? No humidity and warm. warm. Okay. <laughs> I was going to expect you to say cold. Best. 
<laughs> Why you have that up there? Uh, what simulation software were you guys using in that? That is, uh, I believe that one is Magma, isn't it? Maybe not. Could be. Sure. Can could be a, a solid cast. I know we've used both. Yeah, there's a number of different softwares out there that that do it. Um, we try to differentiate a couple times just so we can uh, make sure we're, we're testing out the different softwares. Magma is the top of the line software now, right now. Okay. So last process. It's almost, like a, tilt. it's almost like a mixture of both, right? It is a mixture between static and, and tilt pour, okay. basically. So, so explain reverse tilt a little bit. Reverse tilt is almost identical to a tilt pour, but you're pouring into the top of the part like a static pour. Okay. Um, either into a riser. Um, I haven't seen many with gating. They're always going into a riser directly on the part. Okay. So again, that, you know, you're kind of taking the benefits from both. Yes. But it comes with some negatives. Disadvantages as well. Sure. Um, pouring into it like that is a disadvantage, but you're using a cup and tilting just like a tilt. Okay. So that kind you of helps it. you out. Yeah. Um, and the biggest thing on um, reverse tilts is no drops and no sharp angles. You have to let it flow. Okay. So what kind but of you probably similar to your 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 parts that you were talking about on the static, you can run into the issues of the, you're you're dumping metal directly right in there. The, right in the top. So you're trying to target to cut that out. You're you're when you pour into the top, you gotta target the heavy section. Okay. And a lot of times yeah. we're cutting that off apart or exactly. Okay. And hope you hope you that your uh, gas and everything goes up into the riser. Yep. So what kind of parts would you use reverse tilt for then if there are these limitations? What kind of parts? Yeah. Something with a heavy section in the middle. Um, yeah, so I'd say a lot of larger larger type castings yeah. or castings where, um, you know, Monty was heavy mentioning, sections. like yeah, heavy sections or wheels earlier, um, you know, so are, are pretty consistent in geometry or, you yeah. know, heavy, heavy section parts. Okay. It's pretty much a, a standard geometry would be square, round. Okay. Great. Any other questions you guys may have there? There had a few couple questions pop up here. Um, one was, so how should you um, superheat or how much should you superheat? much super heat um I, I'd need, I would need a little more information okay. um so you know with our parts being custom um we're, we're talking you know everything being custom not not just your design uh but there's gas levels hot yeah. temperatures mold temperatures um you know things are really controlled specific to the product um so if you're talking about adding heat or removing heat uh it's it it's controlled. It does. Um, a lot of them all need to be chilled or cooled uh, versus being heated. Yeah. It depends on the thickness of the part and the geometry. Absolutely. Okay. Um, we did have another question about the types of materials. I know we only use three different materials here um, at our facility, but can you talk about the permanent mold process and possibly um, you know, stainless steels or steel as, um, like as a casting? No. Can't pour steel in a permanent mold. You'd, uh, you'd melt the mold. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be good. No, you're, you're pouring the same type of metal into the same uh, mold which would be a, a high, high tensile steel or even a cold, cold roll steel. They're, they're pouring at uh, 3,200 degrees. That's a little too high. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Have you what, ever what made- types of metals? You can make permanent molds using uh, beryllium copper and pour copper, copper parts. Uh, that it, it chills twice as fast as a steel permanent mold. Okay. 
but uh, that's about the only other permanent mold that I've ever used was uh, beryllium copper. For so, copper. so would you would you go that route then if you got smaller parts that you don't need to feed a bunch of metal to? Yes, so it chills that quick. That, yeah. Okay. You could do small, thin uh, aluminum bars. I would, I would imagine. Okay. Okay. This is another good question. Um, so Sean asked, uh, on reverse tilt pour, do you have to maintain the same draft angle for release or do you make it up for the mold release? It would be exactly the same as a tilt pour on as far as draft angles. Um, the only difference is, is your riser would be reversed compared to a tilt pour. Okay. So you can pull it out of the top. <clears throat> Great. Um, well, if there aren't any more questions, I know there were there were some questions out there about uh, you know some specific uh, like porosity. Um, you know, so if, if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out directly. I know Jonathan had taken down that question. We'll make sure we get the uh, the previous webinar over to you on those defects, uh, what to look out for. A couple uh, different articles or, or podcasts or even webinars that are listed here um, that have some interesting tips and tricks. Uh, you know, my favorite right there in the middle, Engineering's Guide to Metal Casting. Um, really understanding, we just hit on it, but not in a lot of detail, the, yeah. the draft angles you're looking for, um, how you feed apart, uh, different sizes that go into yeah. different processes, things of that nature. So um there is a, a white paper that that goes with that but that is a that's a one of my favorites right there um with that uh we'll let everybody go and hope uh, you learned a lot today on our, our webinar